All right. Everybody got it? Got it. Go. Got it. Well, welcome everyone to uh, Sanctuary Online, uh, to our Zoom meeting today. And we're, we're on the last week of the month. So therefore, it is book club meeting, which is what we always do the last week of the month. And tonight we're discussing This Tender Land um, by, tell me his name again. William Kent Kruger. William Kent Kruger. I knew you would know it, bud, because you've been reading books by this guy, right? <laughs> I've read three of them. So oh, my it. goodness. Yeah, we'll have to have some conversation about that. Might be worth uh, putting some of those books back up to, to take yeah. a look at after a little bit later. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So what we're going to do is just go through and talk about this book. I've got a couple of questions that we'll talk about. And then at the end, um, we'll remind you. Well, let me just say, um, so I don't forget, that on August 10th, which is the next time we're gonna meet, what we're doing is we're alternating every other week. And then on the weeks that we are coming in, on the first, the second week of the month, we're doing artists, okay? So we're um, um, interviewing artists. And this week we're gonna be interviewing, uh, her name is Hamila. And uh, she, oh, you're gonna, you're gonna have something to share. There we go, from her, from her website. There you go. And she uh, creates jewelry. And the way we got to Hamila is she and Edie Disler, who was our first artist that we um, interviewed, um, are good friends. And so um, Hamila is, uh, um, is going to be interviewed this time. So she's mm -hmm. going to be on August 10th. And then, of course, on August 27th, um, which is our next book club meeting, we're going to be reading um, Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine. So that's the next thing to remember from that. I still have it. Nice. Read it with an open mind. All right. Got it. We shall do that. Yes, Janet. Yes. <laughs> All right. Are you good? Out on a Limb by Shirley McLean. Oh, you're awesome. Look at you, Barb. You're just putting all kinds of good stuff out there for us. Is Barb <laughs> doing all that? Huh? Yeah. Is yeah, Barb doing all that? Very Cheryl cool. wouldn't be doing that. You know, I don't yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. All right. Well, let's start with something really basic. Was this book easy to read or tough to read? What do you think? Well, I've read it twice, so I guess it's, it's easy for me. Okay. I thought it was easy to read. I thought I was really glued to it. I like this book. Yeah. It was easy yeah. to read, but it was really full of stuff. Full. Yeah, it was very full, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what was the, the, there was another book that we read that talked about, um, you know, the, uh, the Hoovervilles, right? And the Four Winds when we read that about the depression and stuff. And that one we all seem to find kind of tough to read because it was kind of depressing. Did this feel the same way or did it? Mm -mm. Wonder why? Why did it feel? Actually, different? it was sad, but it was so well written. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could really relate to the storyline and what they were going through. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, and so did you, Did what did you like about it the most or what did you not like it about it? Hmm. I like the surprises. Yeah? Yeah, I like, you know, it's like certain things and it's like, oh, and it just kind of jumped over and I'm like, okay. It's something, for me, it made me think a little bit. Okay, like what kind of surprise? Give us an example. Um, well, like, uh, for example, when uh, One-Eyed Jack or whatever he's called, uh, when he was shot and killed and Odie oh, thought that he killed the guy, he comes later on, he shows up and thanks him and stuff. It's like, that was a surprise to me. I was like, okay. And I, and I like that Emmy had that foresight. Oh, okay. sure. yeah. He's not dead and stuff like that. It, it was just some of the surprises. Yeah. And, yeah, I, I and, thought I thought Jack was I wasn't sure if that was for real. You know, I thought, OK, he's going to come back and screw him somehow. But it didn't happen. So that was kind of interesting. 
Yeah, I think Odie kind of wondered about it too, as well, right? You know, when, when that happened, wasn't quite sure that he meant what he was thinking. Yeah. So. Um, and and I wasn't sure about um, oh, brain fart. Uh, what's her name with the? Um, I wasn't sure the whole time. No, you know? no. Yeah. Evangelist. Who who are we talking about? Sister Eve. Sister yes. Eve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wasn't sure about her. Yeah. Well, that's what I was, uh, you know, one of the things that, that takes place is, um, you know, Odie, um, what, you know, I mean, what was your first thought when they encountered her, when they encountered those tent revivals and Sister Eve? What did you guys think of that? I thought she was going to be a fake. Did you? Yeah. And I thought she was going to take advantage of them and turn them in or do something, you know? Yeah. But, and, and, and I kept thinking that, you know, there'd be something good about her. And then I'd, I'd think, oh, that's too good to be true. And then there'd be something good about her. And then, oh, no, that's too good to be true. Yeah. Just kept thinking that all the way through. I knew we were going to get a some kind of a surprise on that. <laughs> and we never did, really. Well, so you, I mean, Odie was like that, too. Or for sure, his brother was like that. Mm -hmm. Odie kind of took that on a little bit and started even thinking that she was she was uh, a fake at one point, you know. But um. But like she said, she didn't say I ever, she said, I didn't ever say I healed them. You know, right. I just yeah. gave them hope basically, you know, so it was a, a bigger thing. But did, when you, I mean, have you guys, you've encountered, you know, this whole tent revival thing before. So when you start hearing, when you first started hearing tent revivals, you know, what was your first, like, oh my, you know, what was your first thought about that? In my case, I, I went to a lot of those kind of things when yeah. I was growing up. And and even though I never encountered one that I ever questioned or thought was, um, you know, was in the, you know, trying to take advantage or anything or, but for some reason, and probably because I've heard it in my life, uh, that a lot of times that is what it was, uh, people, trying to well the snake oil sales kind of yeah, thing sure and yeah. uh taking up the the uh uh donation you know the donations the offerings and stuff I, I you know i'd always heard that they were um that there was a good possibility it was all fake and they were just trying to get money and blah 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 um but i never actually experienced that i don't know why that was in my head hmm. um I guess because I'd heard it from the adults and everything. Yeah. To some extent. Have y'all ever been to any of those kind of things, tent revivals or anything? Or no. no. So it was kind of relatively new for you to be exposed to it, but it still seemed like it was going to be some kind of thing that they were going to run into. Well, mm -hmm. her her right hand man who would go yeah. and pay the people. Yes. Oh, yes. That was kind of the sleazy part right um, but yet she kept him around because i guess he made her what what she was yeah she, he took her from a what a carny or some kind of low life job and apparently he he's the one that made her the way she is she was yeah. well yeah and he he made her that way um, because of all the advertising and because he paid these people, but he mainly paid them uh, from what she said to make the next place that they went to or to start bringing people right. more, more there, you know, so that she felt like the end justified the means, so to speak, as far as getting more people there so she could provide more hope and, you know, you know, right. potentially be some right. more or whatever. Um, and this is all taking place during the depression too. So people really need that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything going on. You know, so Odie, he kind of struggled with the nature of God, right? Um, tornado, tornado God. Yeah, God's a tornado, <laughs> yeah. So how'd you feel about his characterizations and, you know, uh, of, of God? What, what did you think of that based on him? I, don't really I think it was based on his own experience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what he was saying was this tornado problem is destroying everything. 
So that's where we came up with that. So. It changed over time though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That changed over time. Gradually. Yeah. What caused that? What do you think? Hmm. Probably exposure and, and observations and even like Sister Eve with the, um, is that her name? Yeah. <laughs> with, the, yeah. with the revival tent and stuff like that. And I think, you know, different things, you know, started breaking down. And even getting angry at his uh, aunt slash mother and walking off and then realizing, you know, forgiveness. Yeah, the whole thing that she taught him about forgiveness made a huge uh, impact on him, right? Yeah. So that's a, a good point to bring up, Eric, when he first got there and met his aunt, Julia, you know, and uh, we, they were trying to pass him off without telling him what was really going on there. And finally, uh, you know, Julia had Dolores take him out to buy him some new clothes. If he's going to stay here, she wants him to look good and so on and so forth. And he just wouldn't have anything to do with it. And um, what, what did, uh, why didn't he want those new clothes? Why did he say to Dolores he didn't want them? Well, because of the, um, the shanty towns, the, the people who didn't have anything. He didn't want to be looking better than everybody else. And he thought the money could be better used elsewhere. Yeah. Is what so I got, he, the impression I got. So he felt a little guilty about it, right? Right. And that he would feel guilty about it. And uh, I, I was, uh, when, when he did that, I was quite uh, impressed with that, you know, um, because that was something that kind of took me back because I thought, well, you know, and he's finally coming into something. Um, I'm surprised that he didn't want, you know, what was there. But also I wondered, maybe it's part of it is because he's just not used to that. You know, he didn't, he didn't have any idea what to do with that. You know, he wasn't attached to clothes, you know. Um, and he was just so ahead of his time. I mean, yeah. yeah. Reading it, I kept thinking, well, this kid's, he's not 12 years old. He's got to be 15 or 16 at least. Yeah. Yeah, he, he really seemed to have some creative ways of figuring out how to survive, right? And, he seemed um, a lot more mature than his years. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, he had a lot of survival techniques and uh, <laughs> some of them could, it could be, uh, you know, it's like, wow, you know, that, that, what were some of these survival techniques and what were your thoughts about uh, how he used them? Yeah. Like he lied. Oh, he was yeah. lying all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, he, he. Was it him or Albert that made them all change names? I think it was Albert. It was Albert. It may have been Albert. Yeah. So that for survival. And um, I can't stealing, it. killing, you know, storytelling, storytelling, you know, storytelling was, you know, I don't know. But what else? Uh, what did you think? Those techniques. What I mean, where do you like? Can you go along with him? Because you're like, yeah. This is just what you have to do if you're in his situation. Or did you think, really, dude, do you have to go down that path? Um, you know, were you afraid for him when he was doing some of these things? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, when he hopped in the back of uh, Sid's car and went down to see what Sid was up to when he was going and paying off these people, right? I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, my God, dude, what are you doing? Get out of that car. <laughs> Uh, he just did some pretty crazy things, leaving the whole group, you know. Um, mm -hmm. What about his and Albert's relationship? Kind of complicated. Very. I think that turned out to be kind of a foreshadowing of who he really was. In a what way. do you mean, Janice? 
Well, he was very attached to him as if he were his real brother because he thought he was. But then again, um, there were times when, you know, he couldn't figure out why they were so different. And, um, but that's just siblings anyway, I guess, you know, in those cases. But, uh, but as it turned out, they weren't real brothers. So why do you think Albert felt because Albert kind of knew they weren't, right? Why do you think he felt like yeah. he had to be so protective of him? Well, the, the parents were gone and um, I don't know. Um, that was the only family he had. Yeah, yeah. And he was the oldest. So automatically, if you're the oldest. Mm -hmm. yeah, that seems to be, you know, it, even today in real life. Uh, Carol and I both talk about the fact that we have the oldest child syndrome in our families. Are you? Yes. Are both, both of you the oldest in your family? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I am too. I'm the oldest. And I, and I think it, it, you have to, you assume a certain responsibility. It's just there. It's just assumed and some people step into it and some people don't. I think he did. I mean, he, he really did. Yeah. And he had more experience as well. Yeah. He was a little more level-headed, and he knew that. I think he was beyond his age. He, he was more mature. They both worked. Yeah. Both worked. Yeah. yeah. And Emmy was beyond her age. Oh, Barry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. What did you, what, what are your thoughts, or what were your, did you believe in her ability, or what did you think of that, that? Uh, ability that she had to kind of prophecy dream something and kind of change what might have happened you know did you think it was that or did you think it was more of a prophecy thing maybe it's I didn't see that till the end when they were talking toward the end of the book as far as her changing when she had um, had her visions or whatever and she would say he's not dead or um things of that nature. I didn't, I didn't catch that as far as foreseeing or changing what was uh, the actual outcome that could have been until they said that toward the very end. So. Yeah. You think that's, that's something that's possible out there in the world? I think it is. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll know next month when we read uh, our next book. <laughs> <laughs> a foreshadowing of things to come. <laughs> yeah. 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 Prophesying or uh, she seemed like she was prophesying it, you know, really. Um, but then that's what they talked about was that, you know, gosh, if he had been just a little bit moved over on that, he wouldn't have fallen on that exact ledge or, you know, just different things that transpired that, you know, if he had, if he had fired that gun and it had hit him exactly one little millimeter over, it would have killed one-eyed Jack, right? And so on and so forth. So um, a lot of things like that. And it was kind of interesting. I'd never, um, I've obviously heard of prophesying, but I had never heard of that before, of somebody other than going back in time or whatever, of really being able to just tweak history just a tiny bit to, to change something, you know, before it really happened, you know? Had you guys heard of that before? No? no we didn't uh, really catch it. Yeah? Yeah? Um, I, I also thought it was kind of interesting that this, um, we were reading this book about the same time as the Canadian discovery of the mass Aboriginal graves, you know, coincided, you know, with the same timing. And um, uh, it was kind of interesting to me to discover that this is not just in the US, but it is also, you know, just anywhere that there were um, these kinds of residences, you know, that went on. I didn't know that there were this kind of residence. Did you guys know about this before you read this book? A little bit. I yeah. knew a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, would, 
Yeah. Okay. Did you know about it? I did. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I did too. You did too. Yeah. yeah. And what what did you think of Mose and his transition? You know, going from this, you know, just easygoing guy to his transition of who he became, his transformation. That was a little confusing for me. Yeah? Yeah, I just, I had to read it again just to see, okay, he found these bones and then he had to go off and do his quest. Maybe that's just the nature of the Indian. You go off and find yourself and you do the quest. Yeah. Um, I think that's what it was. Yeah. I'm like you, bud. I, I kind of got a little confused. I think it would have been better if they had inserted something in there about mm -hmm. what was going on with him. Because, yeah. you know, give us a little history yeah. on that before it actually took place. Yeah, because um, I've read a couple of books and they did they do go off and do it when they're young, yeah. become a man. Yeah. Uh -huh. They didn't explain this much to me. At all. They didn't. But where did you where did you think he got this uh, information just from the first skull, or do you think it was somewhere else? Maybe it was Maybe just it heard it over at the school because it was an Indian school. Um, oh, from some of the other kids that lived there, maybe. Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Yeah, it's possible. And or it just came people. natural. I mean. It was his heritage, you know, his Indian heritage. But I mean, what about that guy, Forrest? Do you think he had any? I think he had some influence on that. Yeah. 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 And and uh, and he his mother when they found him as a kid, they cut his tongue out and killed the mother. But we never know why that happened or how that happened that was a little confusing for me yeah it would have been it would have been you would have wanted to know why did that happen or whatever and it's just like why do you think the author didn't tell us that yeah. i don't know well, i think sometimes when that happened it um the kids themselves never knew what actually happened. They just experienced the trauma of having their tongue cut out or being by the side of their dead mother. Um, and there was no other context for it. So, um, and the fact that he was silent all this time, I mean, Forrest was speaking for him in some ways or explaining some of it to us, but the, I mean, most himself didn't always have words literally and figuratively. Yeah. Did you have something, um, Bonnie or Carol, to say? No, I just, what I was going to say is that his background wouldn't have impacted the story, the rest of it. His silence was necessary in order to develop um, what was going to happen later. Why do you say that, uh, Carol? You, know, you you read many books and you don't need information, secondary information. I know, but why do you think it that his silence was it, it helped the uh, frame what was going to happen later? Well, because when he came into his own and he had he was impacted by the bones and the stories, um, that's when he became true character in the story. Yeah. You know, um, the author kind of, other than Albert and Odie, who were white kids that were thrown in this Indian uh, residential school, um, other than them, you really didn't hear anything from any of the other Indian kids. The author didn't give you any of that. I almost wonder, I mean, the silence, him, him having his tongue, it's, it's almost like the whole 
the whole thing was silent. The people just didn't know about it. You know, the whole, what about all the, the letters that people wrote, the money that they sent? Nobody knew yeah. of any of it. It was like they were silenced, completely silenced and completely, uh, you know, you don't hear anything about what happened to them, right? No, and the ability, the child that disappeared that yeah. they couldn't find. Right. It definitely happened more often than not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as you can see from like even the mass graves in Canada, but you know, I don't know that we've had mass graves in the US, but there definitely were a lot of deaths from stuff like that. And, uh, you know, taking away from their entire culture and everything, just telling them you're not allowed to speak your native tongue, you, you know, have to um, only speak English, their entire culture, everything about them was taken away from them, right? And um, we just try to obliterate them like we, like we did the buffalo. Yeah. Cut mm -hmm. them off. Get rid of all of them. True. Yeah. And is there any, I mean, any reason for doubt as to why so many folks on Indian reservations that have stayed there now, um, you know, from the, what they grew up to or what they grew up with in the past, you know, um, their history with these kinds of residential places, no wonder so many of them are depressed or drinking or whatever and can't seem to get enough self-worth to move on, right? Um, it's a huge, 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 huge thing that, that, that occurred there. They stripped their families and sent them off there. Um, so Cut their hair wouldn't let them speak ink, wouldn't wouldn't let them speak their languages. Right. Yep. Yep. Does anybody have any great quotes or situations that were special to you or profound as you went on through the book? Quotes. Yeah, you have one. Yeah, I do have one. Do you? But <laughs> see if I can read find it. You just use it in that. Uh, yes. I don't know if I have that. One. I don't have my computer here. Go ahead. Keep talking. I'll find it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have one handy with them? A quote or some kind of situation or experience that was especially special or profound to them? I think, I think the one thing that got with, because I was wondering how the title came in and stuff, mm -hmm. as when they said, this tender land, God is in every, God in everything. I'm going, ah, oh, that's where the title came from. Yeah, and the dirt I found rain, my sky, quote. Yeah. Here's a quote. I, I found my quote. There is a river that runs through time and the universe, vast and inexplicable, a flow of spirit that is at the very heart of existence and every molecule of our being is a part of it. What is God but the whole of that river? And because of that quote, because of that quote, um, I wrote, about nature and the Holy Spirit for our church weekly news. Tell them what you called it. We called it the, the, the title. Seeing the Holy Spirit in nature. Yeah, cool. And where where was that quote in the book? What was it from? What was the context? <laughs> where it was, I don't know. Was I don't know that one. What, Eric? Mine was on page 151. But what was the context of the quote? Who was saying it or where, where, where did it come from? I think, wasn't it um, One-Eyed Jack? Seemed like it was around One-Eyed Jack time, was it? I think it was at the very end. I thought it was at the very end. Hmm. Was it at the end during the epilogue or whatever? I thought it was. You remember, Carol? No, I don't remember. I we we don't even have the book any longer. Um, I had written it down. It's the epilogue. Is it it's in the epilogue? Yeah. First, the first, uh, first paragraph of the epilogue. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. You right. know, we read the book um, couple, long ago. Yeah, we read the book a couple of months ago, or well, even before that. And um, we share books with friends and neighbors and family or whatever, you know. So we discovered this evening when we went to look for it that the book is already taken. So someone else oh. is doing our book. <laughs> Well, that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I think this is one of the ones that we had recommended for this, you know, suggested. I think, yeah. you, one of the yeah, I think you guys did. And I also think that, uh, Bud, you, you, Bud, put this yeah, as and Bud, yeah, once too. And yeah, we discovered our book is in someone else's yes, reading room. Someone else is reading it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was quite a quote, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. What what does that mean to you? So what Carol, tell us a little bit more about that. Why don't you read your article? Your yeah, what you it's what really you, short. Well, we both write for our church and we edit each other's things, so that's why you know it, it's short. It's short. I I started with the quote and I said, reading this, I thought about the inheritance God gave us, the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that the apostles would need help to continue his work. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, John 20, 22. The Feast of Shabbat is one of Rabbinic's three major agricultural festivals and the second great feast of the Jewish year. One of these three pilgrimages feasts when all Jewish males were required to appear at the temple in Jerusalem. So the apostles and some disciples of Christ were together. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house from Acts 2. That's the background. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is called, <clears throat> that's also background. Going back to Kruger's quote, Jesus through the creator has provided nature to help bring some understanding to how the spirit is with us always providing help. Somehow by seeing nature, we see the good God has provided. A primary way God nourishes our souls with God's loving presence is through the beauty of nature. The face of the spirit shines on us in the sun, moon, and stars. Love speaking to us and warming us from the heavens. And that's from Psalm 19, one through six. We receive the joy of the spirit in splashing waves and playful animals. Nature re reveals to us beauty, glory, power, wisdom, presence, creativity, and most of all, loving care, knowing the spirit. We are drawn to spend time in the beauty of nature and to enjoy animals, to take a walk on a beautiful day, play with your dog in the grass or hold a cat are reliable ways for many people to connect with God's loving presence. And I think part of the tender land, there's more that I wrote, but um, I think that part of the story was the beauty and the power of the beauty of the land and the ugliness and the power the ugliness had but yet was removed by the people in it. Mm. Yeah, that's a beautiful article. Uh, thank you. There, there is more. I just yeah didn't want to take all our time. No, that's okay. Um, so when you talk about this tender land, when he's named it that, that comes out for me when you say that. It's like the land is tender. Uh, it expresses all this beauty, but there's also all this ugliness. And so there's this tenderness, this thing that kind of pulls back and forth between those things, right? It's fragile in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, that way, yeah. That's, that's it was shown in the book. Yeah. There was beauty. Yeah. There was poverty. There was pain, pain um, depression. Yes. Struggle. Yeah, a lot of struggle. And survival, right? Yes. And survival. And survival. Figuring out ways of surviving, yeah, and um, and just pushing on, pushing on, pushing on. Hope, you know, to move towards the next thing. A lot of hope, yeah. That was one of the An amazing thing is. Hi, Joby. Bye, Joby. People. Joby popped in. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what to me was amazing. But these were all children, really. They were yeah. just children. But weren't allowed to be children. 
right? No, they, they had to grow up immediately. Which was kind of typical for that time of the, uh, you know, that the crisis that was going on during the depression, right? So, mm -hmm. Eric, what were you saying was yours that you was the thing that was a quote from you? I, I think we. That was the one on um, page 151 about the, the, this tender land. It was oh. um, the second, the, I guess the main paragraph toward the top of page 151 where um, it was, uh, who is he? It's the, I'm looking, glancing back to see who actually said it. But he was, oh, the pig scare. Yeah. Um, and he, he was saying, everything's hard work, Buck. You don't have your thinking around in life that, that'll kill for sure, but then it, it goes down. Ask me God's, so ask me, God's right here in the dirt, the rain, the sky, the trees, the apples, and the stars in the cottonwoods. And you and me, it's all connected and it's all God. Sure, this is hard work, but it's good work because it's a part of what connects us to this land, but this beautiful tender land. So mm. I'm going. Huh? Incredible okay. things for one-eyed Jack to say, right? Is yeah. it said that? Yeah. Wow. So what was in the attic? What, why was the, I, and the graves? I thought maybe he had killed his wife and daughter. That's the impression him. I got. Oh, definitely. But, but they were alive, right? Because he, he said later that they were wherever they were, Chicago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I thought he had killed him. And there was some guy that was involved. They kind of led us to believe that happened. Right. I believe there was a lot of kind of background that sounded like, uh oh, I bet he killed them, you know, or whatever. Well, he uh, went out to some oak tree and cried. Yes. And that's when Odie saw him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a grave there with. Me the too. Daughter. I did too. They led me right down that path. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I wondered if it was. Um, physical or sexual abuse that had occurred there. And, um, you know, either with the, the daughter or with the wife or both of one of watching the other or something to that effect that had uh, uh, led them to leave, you know. Well, it uh, sounded like the other guy took them away from him. Yeah. Took the wife mm -hmm. and the daughter away from him to save, to save them. From yeah, to save them, right? And yeah. yeah. And then when he when he came to and he survived that bullet that they couldn't be moved and was thanking Odie, it's like, oh. Yeah. But what happened? Yeah, Which, you don't know what happened. You just know that Odie had a real bad feeling when he was up there, right? Yeah. Yes. When he was in that uh, in that attic. He sure got a dose of anti uh, alcohol in the whole thing, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, what did you think of the whole deal with Aunt Julia really being his mother? What that was quite the story. I figured it out just a little before they revealed it, but. But it was, um, so it wasn't terribly surprising when, I, you know, they finally actually revealed it. But um, I kind of I thought they were leading toward that from the time he got there, actually. Uh, maybe even before that, there was something there that made me feel like maybe there was a story here that we weren't introduced to yet, you know, and that there's going to be a big surprise. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I wasn't all that surprised by the time we you know, got to the truth. Yeah. I think when Odie, when Odie asked about that, she didn't have any pictures of Albert. Oh, yeah. And I was like, oh, I think that's when I started thinking, well, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So she... She was kind of a survivor too, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to 
figure out how to deal with the fact that she had this this son that she wasn't quite sure what to do with. And she wasn't sure that she could take care of him. Right. But her sister was doing a good job with Albert, so. Yeah. And I can't remember how she knew about this school. And why she why she had them sent there. She didn't have them sent there. She well, didn't know about the death of uh, of um, of the father Zach. She didn't know about the death of Zach till later, and found out that the two kids were at the school because um, because Thelma had killed Zach. Thelma yeah. Griffin. Yeah. yeah, and I think Thelma finagled the kids to come to the to the school. Who yeah. did? Uh, the Black Witch. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So she finagled it, and she she said that she did that to protect them, to give them a home or do something for them. Uh, there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Julia found out they were there. How I can That's a little piece. I just. For she, some didn't, reason. she didn't know about the death of uh, Zach, their father, right. until later. And then when she found out they were at the school, she knew she couldn't bring them to the house. Right. Because so of and she had heard that the school was very good and very supportive. And so she sent money to help them, which obviously never got to them. Well, right. later it did, but that was on the, on the run. <laughs> so whatever happened to all that money? When they were with, do you think Jack took it? Yeah, Jack said he took mm -hmm. it. He apologized for uh, spending all their money. Oh, yeah. right. At, toward the end. When they re-met him again, yeah. I was right, glad right. I want to read it again. <laughs> Did it have an impact on you other than what Carol was saying or what you guys are saying about uh, faith or about God? Did it have an impact on you for in that way? Like a change? Well, not necessarily a change, but um, I don't know any kind of any kind of impact on your own faith at all. Uh, not for me. Just a reaffirmation, basically, or. Knowing that God's there, yes. Yeah. I was thinking about at one point when I was reading, you know, back and forth about the revival tents and uh, stuff, I was thinking about my own journey where I was baptized as an infant, but in 78, I was baptized by submersion, by choice. So, you know, it was like, it was, I was thinking about those times. So, in the river. In the river, yeah. In the river. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, who was your favorite vagabond? Odie. Odie? <laughs> I think Odie. Yeah. And why? Well, since it was all written from his perspective, um, I think we found out an awful lot more about who he was. For one thing, he was very, you know, well-rounded in the in the entire book, um, and his changes of, of beliefs and all kinds of things. We didn't find quite that much depth in the rest of them. Mm. Uh, he may have been promoted by the the writer, um, but I don't know. I just I liked him. I, I, I was. I don't remember who said this, maybe Bud, um, that I was all constantly surprised every time I was reminded, and they did say this several times, that he was 12 or 13 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I kept, I kept thinking, when the whole thing, mm -hmm. I kept thinking of him as being an older teenager, like 17 mm -hmm. or 18, but that was Albert. You know, Albert was that old, that age. And, um, but he'd say something like, well, that was something for a 13 year old, you know, that was, or, you know, they keep referring back to his age. 
And it always brought me back to the reality that he was only 13 years old. Yeah. Did, did anybody have a different vagabond that they either identified with or liked more than Odie? He can't. I like Odie, but you know what? I, I, I like Annie. I like mm -hmm. her in and out and grabbing the hand and, and oh, she was precious. And, you know. She kind of held them together in a way, right? Yeah. I mean, that was yeah. part of the reason they stayed together was to protect her, you know? Mm -hmm. so, right, that's um, true. What about Odie's girlfriend? What was her name? Oh, Mary, Mary Beth. Beth. Mary Beth. Schofield or something. Mary Beth Schofield. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, in the epilogue, do you get the impression that he found her? Yes. I did. Yeah? I did. And then, and then who, did. who was sitting at the river? Her? That's what I didn't get. Was that Emmy and the end? What? what? At the, at the, toward the very end on the epilogue, it said that they were sitting underneath the elm tree. Oh, that's is that, Emmy. Uh, is that Emmy, Emmy and him? Yeah. Yes. That's that's awesome. him. Yeah. So. But well, what he, do you... What did you he had a whole, whole real explanation of where everybody was basically now or, you know, at the end of the book, but. What uh, happened to Moe's and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, what happened to each one of them and but where I wasn't they sure, I wasn't sure when I was reading it that that he had actually married Mary Beth. I, I got there. the impression I mean, he that did. That was vague to me. I wasn't so what do y'all really think? Who thinks he married Mary Beth? And they lived happily ever after and had their children and everything all together. <laughs> I can't remember. I do. <laughs> Kate, what do you think? Don't know, huh? Not sure. <laughs> it sure sounded like he wanted to make it be like that. I mean, it's what it felt like to me. Maybe I just was wishful thinking and hoping that that's what happened. <laughs> it's a Hollywood ending. It's a Hollywood <laughs> ending, yes. <laughs> Lifetime ending. To be seen in the movie. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> to be seen in the movie. Yeah. Kay, why did you not sure? Why you're like, eh, not sure? Well, because it, it's specifically not spelled out for one. Right. Um, but but it does, um, just the way he described her and the fact that she, it sounded like she was toward the end of her life, um, but that he was, in fact, with Emmy under the tree, but it, clearly he hadn't married her either. So. Yeah. Well, she was, I guess she wasn't all that much younger than him, right? She was, what, six years younger or seven years younger than him or something like that. So, Emmy? Mm -hmm. yeah, like probably six. Yeah. Well, but he was only 12. I mean, he kept referring to himself as 13, but he had not reached his 13th birthday. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Almost 13. Almost 13. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, did anybody think that he and Emmy married? No, because they say that so, that some, because of that. There's something else you that know. comes before that uh, that made me feel like he married Mary Beth. Mm -hmm. um, he was describing where they all were as if it were now, uh, and they did. They weren't really all that close in the end. The what I'm remembering, uh, they saw each other occasionally or something like that but um gee where am i picking that up most most had gone to the gallaudet school for the deaf yeah, yeah that's right and um i don't remember where albert went seems like he albert died. didn't he go to engineering oh, school? albert died in the yeah down oh down in the war oh, he was in a, a, yeah in the war and yeah then, um Yeah, the, some of the stuff wasn't real clear. I reread it because it, and where I thought maybe it was uh, Mary Beth that he married is when I reread it, it was, he was talking about talking to his great grandchildren. Yes. And how they liked his stories. And Age 443. The princess, and yeah. the princess had died. Yeah. And that's where I got the impression that he had married Mary Beth, but she had died. Well, it says, and the princess with the unlikely name of Mary Beth's. Schofield and how after a long separation 
and many trials, they married and lived happily ever after on the banks of a river called the Gilead. Yeah. 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 That's where. That's where we picked it up. Yeah. See, I listen to my books. I don't have them to look back at. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't know if that's really a story he's told or if it's actual that that mm -hmm. was a story he was telling that was actually had but most of the time told all truth. truth. Yeah. They were true. Mm -hmm. Very different. They had some truth to it. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it was a true story with that's written in the way of fiction. I mean, it had a lot of truth to it, but he made up stuff to make it more interesting or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was uh, the invention of wings? It reminded me of the invention of wings or even uh, the four winds, uh, just because there's so much his history with it. And yet it's a novel, novel based on a lot of history or a lot of, you know, what it, what had happened in reality, right? You know, um, I I'm learning a lot from reading these books, you know, because I've I've never been a history buff at all, and I I'm here. really, yeah, yeah but I'm here. Uh, I didn't know about all the depress uh, everyone going to California, not just the Okies. I know, I didn't it know that. everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what what other books? Did he write, or what else did he write about? Is it all historical novels, but or? Uh, Ordinary Grace, there's two of them, uh, and Let's Ordinary see. Grace I really liked. Yeah, we read Ordinary Grace. Did you? Did you? Yeah. I've kind of forgotten what it was about, but I liked it. <laughs> but Kruger also writes um, mysteries. Hmm. Right. Uh, oh, that one was. Mysteries? Was that a mystery? Ordinary Grace wasn't a mystery, but the other one was. I oh, okay. Uh, was Ordinary Grace a historical novel like this one? Somewhat. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember because we read that one first. Oh. That's been months And ago. that's been a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I just wondered if that was his genre, kind of, you know, historical novels or whatever. Well, the but the other one, there's a mystery one. I forgot the name of it. Uh, Before Ordinary Grace. Um, and um, I don't remember it. Hmm. Yeah, we could probably look it up. Mm -hmm. But I later on down the line, I think we should read Ordinary Grace. Okay. <laughs> to buy the book again. Then you'll be um, able to remember it, but if you read it again. Yeah. <laughs> I have a bad retention. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I have to generally go back and read certain sections anyway, at least yeah. to yeah. remember anything about them. So. Yeah. Well, does anybody have anything else they want to say about this book? Or are we pretty well? Oh, Barb's going to bring us and show us something. All the books he wrote. Yay! Uh -huh. Barb! <laughs> 19 or more. Oops. Wow. I just keep. Oh, ordinary Grace. Yeah. What's yeah, what's the mystery one, Barb? It's the mystery one. Um Killer Deal? No. That's a different author. Iron Lake. Iron, Iron Lake. Lake. Okay. Yeah. It was Lake. good. Okay, cool. That and it's part of a series. Oh, it is. Okay. That's book. But is this the series? I think it is. Boundary yeah. Waters and Perfect Two, Book Three. Yeah. There's three books there in a row. Oh, book three. Yeah, it says that book one, book two. Oh, I see. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Well, thank you, Barb. Appreciate it. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Should do that. <laughs> wow. All right, well, if does anybody have any other comments that they want to make about this uh, book or thoughts about it? It was a pleasant book to read. I'm looking forward to the next book. It's going to be completely different, right? Oh, yeah. In a, in a way, there are some, some things that are sort of similar. Okay. <laughs> On the spiritual side. Um, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's very different in, in its presentation, yes. Uh, however... Uh, Shirley, 
she never says this is true or that is true or I you know or I believe this is true. She says, could it be that this is true? Hmm. Interesting. You know, could it be that this is what happens or that is what happens? Hmm. So it brings your mind to going. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> so it's a, it opens your mind, just like you said, a yes. mind opening thing. Yes. Okay, good. And let me, can I preface that just a little bit? Because I've read probably at least half of her books. She's written uh, very many books, but um, a lot I didn't even realize she had written. But the person that introduced it to me, and this has been years and years ago, probably oh, 35, 40 years ago, um, told me to read these other two books also. Uh, not necessarily, she said, you don't have to read them in order necessarily, but I found it good to read them in this order. In case you have a little more time, you might want to read a couple of these before you even read out on a limb if you've got that much time. But one of them is Don't Fall Off the Mountain. And that is, I believe, the one where she goes to um, uh, the Himalayas. And uh, there's hints of, of stuff coming into her head going, hmm, you know, how, how she's a very spiritual person and apparently had been for a long, long time, her whole life, really. Um, but there's a lot in that book that kind of hints, it's, but it's not as nearly as out there as out on a limb. And then uh, you can't get there from here. Mm. That's a fascinating book because that was during the Nixon administration and she was asked by Nixon and she and a, a group of women uh, to go to China. You know, Nixon kind of got in with China and um, recognized China for the first time. It's, you know, how many, I don't even know how many years uh, the United States had not even recognized China. And, um, and so he kind of made friends with the, the China. And he sent this women's delegation there. And mm -hmm. she was part of that. Uh, okay. And she writes this book about it. So you get a real good idea of who she is, you know, and kind of how she began to formulate some of these uh, questions in her head and how she uh, talks about them and so forth. Yeah. So if you ever get a chance to read those two, even if you read them after Out on a Limb, they are worth reading. <laughs> All of her stuff is, and it was kind of progressive. Uh, after that, after Out on a Limb, she wrote It's All in the Playing. Okay. Because that was describing more about making the movie Out on a Limb. That's why they were in Peru, was to make that movie. Yeah. And, then, um, and then she writes this other book describing some of the other things that happened then. And then she just continues to... Um, uh, write stuff and get more and more and more in depth, uh, you know, and take on more and more beliefs. Well, we'll, we'll go for this one and mm -hmm. then we'll see what else it brings up for us. And I'm sure you'll have some commentary about the other books when we get to that. Well, one, right? she lives in Santa Fe. I'll be there next week. All right. Well, really? You yeah. can join take our club. I'm dying to meet her. <laughs> Bring her on the club. <laughs> come online there you go. <laughs> good bud <laughs> all right guys um well thank you for joining and don't forget that on august 10th we're going to have an artist interview with Amila. she's got some beautiful jewelry and um it'll be really interesting i'm, I'm looking forward to speaking with her i'm, I'm starting my first process with her uh, i'm going to be the one that's interviewing and i'm starting to uh talk to her tomorrow about what we're going to talk about so it'll be exciting. where does she live she lives in uh, on Mountain Time. I'm thinking she lives in Colorado, but I'm not positive of that. She okay, lives, might even live in. Mm -hmm. Her her jewelry is distributed at three stores in Austin and one store in Arizona, Phoenix yeah. or Tucson. Yeah, she you know what the store names are in Austin? I can. It's on her website. Hi, uh, <laughs> bye. Uh, bye. Dot com. Are you and leaving? It's my All right. All right. Bye. I'm going to take off. Bye, bud. Anyway, stop the